So we have studied language endangerment and the need for language revitalization. So let's say you are a linguist who's working for an indigenous community or that you are a community member yourself and that you see that the language does not have the vitality that you'd like it to have. Maybe some of the children don't speak the language. Maybe only elderly people speak the language. What would you do? What are the steps to revitalize an indigenous language? It really depends on the situation. So I want to propose three scenarios to you and you please come up with some ideas of what would you propose. What would you do if there were only a thousand people in the community who spoke the language and very few of them were children? On the other hand, what would you do if only five elderly people spoke it? And what would you do if no one had spoken it for 300 years? What would your ideas be? Please pause the video. So all these are going to be different. For example, if you have a thousand people, then you might try to reestablish intergenerational transmission and make sure that the adults have chances to speak it to the children. Maybe you can organize cultural activities that encourage the use of language. For example, every human society loves getting together to cook. So you could have some sort of cookout with uh, recipes from the community to ensure that this is an environment where the children can learn words and they can at least start learning simple phrases and go from there. If you only have five elderly people who speak the language, you need to record as much of it as you can right now because you need to um, establish records that other people will use in the future to study the language and bring it back from dormancy to having living speakers. And if no one had spoken in the 300 years, I actually know people who have had to work with this scenario. Um, I have a colleague called Natasha Warner who was working for a community called the Mutsun and the language had not been spoken for over 100 years. And the only materials that existed were like little confession books from Spanish missions where they had lists of sins for you to confess. So that was the only piece of the language that she had from which to extrapolate all the structure and morphemes and phonemes. I have another colleague called Keisha Josephs who, worked, who was a community member from a community called Kalinago in the Caribbean. And what she had were letters from people uh, in the community, but they were written 200 to 300 years ago. And they, were, uh, they had some stuff in French and some stuff in the Kalinago language, and she had to tease the structure of the language from those historical records. So as you can see, this is something that people act are actually confronted with. There's several steps that you could follow. First, you need to perform an assessment of the situation, like we saw with the UNESCO vitality measurements, and figure out where the language is. If there are no speakers, you would need to use any available materials to create teaching programs and to teach it to adults. Um, and I mean any, again, like any 300-year-old letters that you might have around. If the language does have living speakers but they're elderly, you have to document as much as you can so that you can then create the teaching materials. With these, you can develop textbooks and programs to teach the adults who could then become the parents of the children and hopefully they will convince them to speak the language of the children and provide them with a safe environment for them to reestablish uh, intergenerational transmission. You can try to revitalize cultural practices that entail the use of the language. As we mentioned, for example, anything from cooking to, uh, yes, traditional celebrations of the community where it would be natural to use the language. You need to develop some sort of learning program for children. Uh, if uh, bilingual schools, for example, or after school programs where you can um, help them learn it. And once that happens, you need to try to promote the use of the language in the home so that the children don't think that this is just like Latin, like a weird language nobody uses, but try to bring it into regular use again. Hopefully, you'll have the backing of things like the school, the, the community members, the other community members, the local government, and so maybe the language can start to be used in all of these settings. Maybe the school can have events in the language every now and then. Hopefully you'll get an, uh, enough help from the local government where, where they can put up signs in the language and they can have um, cultural events surrounding the language. So all of these bring the language into use and create help create new speakers of the language and also new domains of usage where the language can be safely used and the speakers feel safe speaking the indigenous language. These uh, policies can be top-down or bottom-up, 
For example, all this planning can be from governments or language authorities who try to provide the funds for all these authorities and schools and materials. They, they can be bottom up as well. For example, the community can organize themselves to create bilingual schools. They can organize themselves to offer something called language nests that uh, we'll see in the case of New Zealand in the next video. Uh, these are grandparents teaching the language directly to their grandchildren. So if the parents didn't transmit it to the children, we're skipping that generation and having the grandparents transmit it to the children. We can have programs like Master Apprentice where uh, you shadow an elderly person and you make an agreement to only speak in the language and that way you can gain fluency in the language yourself. So can technology help? What about if we made apps for people to learn or if we made, um, if we translated Star Wars like it has, it has been translated in Navajo, if we translate the operating system on the phones like the Zapotec phone that we have in the middle. What if we created translations of Spider-Man on the left, which is also in the Mexican language Zapotec? Um, so these can help because they can provide a positive impact um, in the way children view the language. If they see it on the phone, then they can realize that this language can really be used for anything, even communicating in technology, which is something that if their phone only speaks to them in English, they are going to associate all the things they want in life from the phone with, I can only get them through English. So they, by themselves, they cannot help, like an app would be forgotten. Just think of how many CD-ROMs have you seen molding in your life. So one technological thing in itself is not going to help. These can help by convincing, particularly younger speakers, that the languages are worthwhile and by helping create communities where the language can be used. So this is a project from an, um, another linguist called Brooke Lillehaugen, and she has been promoting the use of Twitter amongst um, young speakers of Zapotec in Oaxaca. So as you can see, she created, uh, she taught a bunch of kids how to use Twitter and then convinced them to create a community where they exchange tweets at Zapotec amongst them. So this first generation then taught a second generation of Zapotec kids to uh, tweet in Zapotec. And uh, by doing this, a, an organic community was created where people felt safe to use Zapotec in an electronic environment and therefore gain a new domain of usage for the language. So reversing language shift does involve several steps. You need to cre help create new speakers, to recover traditional contexts where the language was used, and to expand the use of the language into new domains of usage, like technology. Uh, technology tools by themselves won't help revitalize the language, but they can help us provide a positive impression upon uh, young speakers that the language is viable as a way to live a 21st century life, and that, um, Yes, and by creating new communities where the language can be used. In the next video, we'll look at specific examples of language revitalization.